25 years ago this week. In an unprecedented outbreak of public support for an illegal organisation, the radio listeners of Dublin had taken to the streets. If you say to anybody of, of our age, uh, you know, Radio Nova, they know immediately what you're talking about. In recent days, the authorities had moved to close illegal radio stations all over Ireland. It proved to those who controlled broadcasting that there was a market there, that there was an audience there, and they had to get on board. It also proved that people could do it without the state. But the state didn't quite see it that way, and it shut down the most successful pirate of them all. The arrival of uh, such a powerful, professional uh, radio station on the Irish airwaves, that actually dramatically changed the way radio worked in Ireland. Radio Nova The music's just begun Radio Nova Europe's number Former Radio Caroline DJ turned millionaire entrepreneur Chris Carey had come to Dublin in 1980, searching for another fortune in the largely unregulated, erratic world of Irish broadcasting. The Ireland of the early 1980s was a miserable enough place. High unemployment, higher emigration, and an economy on the brink of collapse. It really was a hugely depressing time, and emigration and the, and the amount of emigration really sucked the country dry and the lack of money on top of that, uh, and the lack of uh, entrepreneurship. You couldn't get anything done. If you walked into somewhere to borrow money, they'd fall about laughing. Chris Carey had done well. From humble beginnings in Chester, Carey had built a mini empire in computer reselling after a mediocre broadcasting career as the improbably named Spangles Muldoon. I had heard about Chris Carey. Um, he was a figure that was in our imaginations as somewhere, another place we could go to get a job. Didn't strike me as being incredibly good or whatever, but you know, I wasn't interested in being a DJ, I wanted to be in news. And I suppose looking back, he probably really was a better businessman, a better broadcasting entrepreneur than he was a DJ. Carey, along with fellow Radio Caroline DJ Robbie Robinson, whose on-air name was a slightly more believable Robbie Dale, had been told there was money to be made in Irish radio. I'm not sure if he did his market research beforehand. I'm not sure that he did his focus groups beforehand and did his market research in that way. I'd say he had a strong sense that this was an enterprise to, to throw his weight behind and his considerable business acumen behind. Since the mid-70s, channels had been springing up everywhere, with anyone with half a voice or half a transmitter turning their hands to launching a pirate station largely influenced by the British pirate ships such as Radio Caroline. When you think about it, it was bizarre that somebody hired a ship and started a radio station on the ship. I mean, where were we? And was, this the, was this the Berlin Wall or something? Because there was a Berlin Wall around both Britain and Ireland in terms of broadcasting. It came down to people who'd been interested in radios for many years to provide their own radio stations. And usually it was bedrooms and various things like that sort of towards the early mid six, uh, mid 70s. And then later in the 70s, it got a little more commercial with the ARD and Big D going into commercial premises. So I went up to a house in Sarsfield Road in, in Chicor and I used to broadcast in there on a Wednesday night. Terrified I was for the first while and it was just great fun. Who was listening to us? Nobody. Now we have a missing dog report. It's a black Labrador missing from the in Chicor. Rather well down the hockey down in Cork, so we're told. And hello to everybody in the art department. It was from uh, Breaking Glass. I've just forgotten her name. I always do hate It was filling the vacuum, you know, because there was really no alternative to RTE for part of that period. Uh, there was just RTE 1, there was no pop station, there was no popular music station uh, catering to that market. So these pirates uh, sprang up and everybody of my age at that time, I was in my late teens, you know, we listened to one pirate or another and they seemed to almost be uh, almost micro pirates, you know, yeah, every little area seemed to have its own. The stations themselves were um, quite something else. Most radio stations, they were all on above a, a dodgy shop or in a basement somewhere or in somebody's attic or uh, we actually had a, a radio station in a guy's shed. The Fine Gael Arde Fish opened last night at the RDS Dublin. Tommy Vance until 11 o'clock this morning. Until the 
bring you both the good sounds in disco music. And My first pirate station that I broadcast in was Southside Radio. And that broadcast from an old ramshackle mobile home in a field in Rathmichael, County Dublin. Um, and I remember cycling up there as a young fella, age 13, I think I was at the time, with my rucksack on my back and my couple of 45s that I had and a couple of albums. And walking through the field, saying hello to the horses and the sheep on the way up, and parking my racer and going into the, uh, the caravan, the mobile home, which consisted of some pretty shoddy equipment, to say the very least. Then towards the late 70s, business people got involved. They saw that there was potential in this, that the law didn't seem to be interfering as much as uh, maybe it was expected. So this could have been an opportunity to make some money. And then there was a ready-made group of people who were interested in providing alternative music. So there were very very um, interesting surroundings that we had in those days um, but we all had a lot of fun in those days and the one thing about pirate radio throughout its history and I'm sure it's still the same today um, is that people were very passionate about what they were doing and they loved what they did. But Kerry and Robinson had different ideas which didn't involve doing it for fun. They believed that they could gamble on the fact that government inaction on pirate operators would continue and that they could have a free run at launching a super pirate with a big signal, a big sound and, of course, big advertising revenue. The result? Sunshine Radio. The big thing on the dial uh, at uh, 539, medium wave, and we're talking metres, we hadn't even moved to kilohertz in those days, was Sunshine Radio. Sunshine Radio. Good afternoon to you. Welcome to the Tuesday show. Declan me with you for the next four hours. Thank you to Martin for the last four. Five and a half minutes past two. That's player. And these are Rocky Sharp. Sunshine Radio, which would pretty much dominate the Dublin scene for most of 1981, had launched with Robbie Robinson at its head and Carey pretty much nowhere in sight. The relationship between the two had begun to fracture soon after the station went on air. Robbie started to take it in a direction that Chris considered to be too parochial, too much um, or too too close to the the UK model of local commercial radio. Person, Bob Marley, and who are we to argue when people ask for good records? And we also would like to let you know about uh, the Malahide Musical and Dramatic Society. They it started to move into that uh, more middle of the road, comfortable. Um, ILR uh, type format. And I think that's where the, the parting of the waves came. The instant success of Sunshine, however, was a sign of Robinson's energy and talent and a validation of the two Englishmen's belief in the enormous gap in the Irish radio market. But their acrimonious split was an indication of things to come. A fierce rivalry, which was to exist between the two for many years, and Chris Carey's volatility and innate sense of self-belief. Traits which would eventually lead to the destruction of his greatest creation. For Chris Carey, back home on Millionaire's Row in Surrey's stockbroker belt, it was business as usual. But a hankering after what he now knew was a missed opportunity kept him in touch with unfolding events in Dublin. By the summer of 1981, Chris Carey couldn't contain himself any longer. Egged on by Scottish-born Brian McKenzie, another 1960s DJ who'd spent time with him on the pirate ships and was now running a commercial recording studio in Dublin, Chris came to Ireland for another look and another listen. But I think that he realised and had, had a notion and a very strong gut instinct that this was a potential revenue generator. And I think he went in very much consciously to exploit that. Kerry's plan was simple, to do what Sunshine was doing, only better, and of course, to make more money. While Sunshine's signal beamed from the low-lying Sands Hotel at Port Marnock on the north side of Dublin, a position which favoured strong coverage north of the city, Kerry's plan was to transmit from the Dublin Mountains, an elevated location with guaranteed clear, uninterrupted coverage across all of the capital and beyond. More importantly, a strong FM transmitter would dwarf all of the small medium wave technologies used by established Dublin pirates, giving Kerry Station a massive commercial advantage. Over at Sunshine, Robbie Robinson was less than pleased. Freaked out. <laughs> Especially as this was huge fat FM signal, which was clearer. Um, I think Chris used to say that Sunshine Radio sounded like listening to Radio Moscow at night because of the you know, it was only a, a, um, several hundred watts of AM from a hotel in, uh, you know, north of the city. 
uh, reception compared to his 88.1 FM signal was, was really very poor. In Donnybrook, RTE, operating two stations from their Montrose headquarters, were powerless to do anything about it, at least for the moment. In July 1981, Radio Nova broadcast for the first time. Here's Barry Whiteson. What am I going to do? Going to play the hot hits between now and two. Thanks for dropping by. And nothing in Irish radio would ever be the same again. Radio Nova. In 1981, DJ-turned-radio entrepreneur Chris Carey had come to Ireland to establish a new style of pirate radio station. His creation, Radio Nova, soon had people noticing its extraordinary on-air signal and unique presentational style. Nova itself, it had that beautiful sound, gorgeous transmitter sound, nice and warm, friendly. For people whose experience and maybe image of pirate radio in the past, was these little, small little transmitters with uh, a bunch of amateurs on, suddenly became a viable professional radio station with a beautiful signal. The first time I heard the signal of Radio Nova on 88FM uh, back in 1981 was just an incredible experience. Chris believed that there was an opportunity for that kind of radio station uh, with a very, very high quality signal. I mean, on the technical side, which wouldn't be my area, uh, Nova has, uh, I think, even still stands as a kind of a benchmark for, uh, for, for, for quality. Radio Nova. I remember it being in my bedroom and I had this little radio and generally it was on to the medium wave or down, it's five, I think 539 was sunshine or somewhere down there and everyone was saying, no, you got to tune in, you got to go to FM and it was like, well, it was VHF then, I think you looked for on your radio, VHF and up to 88, I think it was. And then this sound and I remember the first record. I remember it was the Doobie Brothers, What a Fool Believes. Oh, but it's after 10 o'clock. Friday morning, it's 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 Friday. You and Brian is here after the news at 7 o'clock. Shop, San Francisco Band. N O V A. And this just came out because I remember Carey telling us later that all this West Coast rock music had been designed specifically for the FM signal. And this song and this sound came out, and it was better than my vinyl player downstairs. I was just blown away. Nova Gold on a Sunday afternoon. The Key to the Radio Nova formula was the style of presentation known as clutter free. Things were really starting to buzz with this big FM signal. Um, you know, the, the rise of clutter-free as a concept and a, an on-air phrase. Clutter-free stereo 88 and 828 AM is Radio Nova, where we play all your favourite songs. It's Radio Nova on a Saturday night with Hugh O'Brien, playing Lover Boy, the album Get Lucky, and working for the weekend. Radio Nova waking up to Friday, John Clark in the morning, the AM drive into work between now and nine. Bailey and Collins, an easy lover. Six and a half minutes past eight, and this must be one of the best quotes of the week. It comes from a rich oil dude. A much slicker, music, more music-driven approach, really sounding like a slick station from Los Angeles, which, of course, uh, you know, Los Angeles was the model for, for just about everything that Chris did. The music was a central part of Nova's uniqueness, too. Quality music that came out of America that had never been heard in stereo. Eagles, Steve Miller, Doobie Brothers, James Taylor, Jackson Brown. All quality music. It was pop rock, um, and hearing it for the first time in FM stereo, I just think was an eye opener to people. Just as important was the quality and strength of Nova's signal, blasting five kilowatts of FM power across Dublin with its studio transmissions now emanating from a purpose built, state of the art facility on Dublin's Herbert Street. Incredible equipment, um, UK broadcast standard uh, equipment, amazing mixing desk, broadcast mixing desk, turntables that you didn't have to put your finger on to get the, the record to reverse to cue it up as we used to have to in those days. Uh, you hit a button and the turntable reversed, so that was amazing. Uh, and then everything was on cartridges, jingles, commercials, songs, and so on and so forth. We were working on cart machines. That's the first time I worked on a cart machine. And the song was on a cart, and you put it in, you pressed this big green button, and out came the sound. And it was like something you'd seen in a movie. Like, it was very impressive. And I just thought, amazing. This is 
a completely new beginning for pirate radio as it was then in Ireland. But to me, it spelt the beginning of professional broadcasting for the first time, independent professional broadcasting in Ireland. Within weeks, Nova was establishing itself as the hottest radio thing in town. Even over at Sunshine, the other new kid on the block, the staff was admitting that Nova was something really special. The reality was that uh, this was a huge threat. And as it transpired, it was the ultimate threat because, as was proven, Nova was a better station in terms of programming and ultimately all that comes down to is listenership. We can talk about it for hours, but ultimately it's the listener who decides. We're getting crucified, <laughs> to be honest. Um, everybody is listening to Radio Nova. By late 1981, many Sunshine staff had moved to Herbert Street, unable to resist the lure of the Nova roller coaster. And Nova was attracting talented new DJs and newsreaders, many of whom would go on to become major players in the Irish broadcast industry. Tom Hardy. Jason Main. Ken Hammond. Dave Harvey. Mike Maloney. Greg Dockran. Anne Casson. And Bob Gallico. John Clark. Colm Hayes. Mike Edgar. Hugh O'Brien. It's Brian Dobson. Sybil Fennell. Gareth O'Callaghan. Tony Fenton. Kerry had also called on a few trusted lieutenants to add weight to a station growing rapidly in size and popularity. Andy Archer, a veteran of Radio Caroline, joined as programme controller. But when Andy came, he brought commercial disciplines because he worked in commercial radio. You're listening to Radio Nova, broadcasting from Dublin on 846am and 88 Stereo. The time is now exactly 3 o'clock and time to join Bob for the latest news. Thank you, Andy. Having worked in Pirates in the 60s, he was now working in established as a commercial programme director. And basically, Chris sublet that responsibility to Andy. For commercial production, station imaging and sheer creative genius, Kerry turned to Tony Allen. Uh, Tony Allen. Tony Allen was volatile. Tony was brilliant during the day. Come the night time, after the few beers, he would start a fight with himself. Born Anthony John Smith in 1949, Tony Allen was a veteran of numerous offshore broadcasters who had drifted from station to station since the effective end of the English pirate industry in the late 1970s. Tony had become no stranger to Irish pirates, recording commercials and jingles for many, but it was on Nova that he found his true voice. Down at the Nova boutique. Tart up your motor car with a Nova sun visor. Stick it on your windscreen and everyone will know you listen. He was somebody I very much admired. I admired his dedication to quality, professionalism. Um, but Tony had good times and bad times. Like when he was good, he was great and he was very productive. And then he would go AWOL. He wasn't very easy to work with. Um, he was very set in his ways. He was a bit of a prima donna, um, but bloody talented with it. What an amazing voice. Clutter Free, Nova 88 FM in stereo. But the volatile and frequently erratic driving force behind the station was Chris Carey. Chris Carey, Radio Nova. It's 25 past nine on the station that plays all your favourites. He could be a very difficult person to work for because he was so, because he was so demanding. I suppose those of us who were in there, and remember, I mean, I was working there in my very early 20s. So this was a fabulous opportunity, a really unique opportunity to get invaluable experience. So I suppose we put up with a lot of that kind of grief um, and I mean, today I suppose it wouldn't be accepted, maybe, um, but we were prepared to put up with it because we were getting this extraordinary opportunity. But he could be very unpredictable. He didn't see the need to conform uh, to the kind of conventions that sometimes can constrain people. Uh, uh, he, he had um, uh, an approach that he did things his way. Uh, he also, uh, in terms of his dealings with people, was very forceful, I thought, that he, if he decided something should happen, it would happen then and there. I thought he was a bollocks, to be perfectly honest about it, um, because he didn't like me because I worked in RTE. And he didn't understand that I could work in RTE and still have that notion of being one of him or one of Declan or John Clark or Dave Harvey or Brian Dobson. Chris's mood swings were legendary. Chris had an extraordinarily unconventional personal life, um, I think to put it simply. So I think this in a way led to the almost schizophrenic type behaviour that uh, we saw from time to time because Chris could really blow hot and cold. 
You don't like a boss who, who you're afraid of. If he was in the building, I would avoid. Um, and I would, you know, you'd pick up the pieces or you'd surround people who had been fired and all of that. There was a real dark side to all of this. Thankfully, I didn't really see an awful lot of the other side of Chris Carey. I'd heard a lot about it. Um, I'd heard about the tantrums, I'd heard about the arguments, I'd heard about the rows, I'd heard about accusations that were thrown at people about various things. Um, and the picture that was created about him was one of uh, a guy who could, you know, lose it. People were fired, they were thrown out, and it was all right for the likes of me, really, who was protected because I was young and, you know, fairly carefree. I didn't have a mortgage, I didn't have kids, I didn't have any of that kind of stuff. I didn't have to take any personal abuse because I, I ducked and dived a bit, and also I was a very small cog in a setup. So, um, but I, I don't think he was a very nice person at all. No. If you worked hard, he treated you well. If you didn't work hard, you were probably fired. Um, he fired people for many reasons. He fired the entire staff once because he couldn't find his watch. And I remember going in one day to, to Nova, and my memory of it is that it was five or six or seven o'clock, that sort of time on a Friday evening, just before we were going for our pints to the Henry Grattan. And there was mayhem in Nova. The station had gone off the air. There was something going wrong with the transmitter. And De Kerry was running up and down the stairs, and he was giving out socks, and he was firing people left, right, and centre. And I walked up the stairs to meet Declan or John or whoever it was, and he said, where the fuck are you going? I says, I'm just going up to me. He says, you're fucking fired. And I says, but I don't even work here. Well, you're fucking fired anyway. This is ridiculous. It doesn't play. Here am I stuck at number 17, and it doesn't go. You know, we can't play 16 instead. That's yes, not. You can. No, that's not fair. I'm going to wait here patiently until this thing queues up, and then I'm going to find out who played it, and then he's going to be working for Sunshine Radio because he won't be working here anymore. <laughs> dare me, dare me to, to murder the man who did this. For somebody I admired to tell me that I could work in his radio station was almost an acknowledgement that someone was saying to me, boy, you have a bit of talent. So I think um, I'll always remember him for that. And I'm, I, I'm actually glad he gave me that opportunity. And I had five extremely good years at that station. I didn't like what his perception was of me, but I admired him as what he did for what he did uh, for the radio business. I admired him for what he did to, for all our careers, ultimately. The Nova sound was bigger than ever, and the station continued to attract listeners with its exciting on-air sound and a series of promotions, including the first radio cash giveaway ever seen in Ireland. Yeah. Ruth, are you sitting down? Yes. Yeah. You are caller number 50. Oh, okay. You have just won £5,000 in cash from Radio Nova. I can't remember the turnover figures, but they were very substantial. And I remember paying VAT bills that were the equivalent of probably Sunshine's turnover in a given month. We were paying in VAT. I mean, it was a very substantial business. It paid its PAYE and its PRSI and its VAT and its ground rents and its rents and its... I mean, only the other day I was talking to somebody about the fact that we had a mast up on Three Rock Mountain and our insurance broker had actually managed to get it insured. I mean, we were a solid business with a solid turnover. Nova even had its own newsroom featuring presenters like Bob Gallico and Brian Dobson and run by Chris Carey's future partner, Sybil Fennell. Sybil Fennell struck me as being extremely professional at what she did. I felt she was a really good newsreader. She was a very fine newsreader. Like, she's, she's one of the best. Radio Nova. It's 11 o'clock. I'm Sybil Fennell. Good evening. And she had a sign-off at the end. It was Sybil for Nova. And I remember hearing that, you know, in shops around the city before I even went to the place. Sybil for Nova. Nova had this open policy of, if you're good and you want to have a, a bit of a, a ball, and this is new and innovative, and people were very creative, for Bob Gallagher to walk in the door, and give us talents, and we all enjoyed him. We all, we all enjoyed his sense of, uh, sense of humor, his voice, the fact that he was American, he was an actor. I think he gave a unique, identifiable sound to Radio Nova in, in those particular heyday times of 82 and 83. Say, Radio Nova is the station with Bob Gallico on it. 
The news gathering operation, to use the phrase, was uh, very rudimentary. We really didn't have reporters in the field gathering news themselves. We were basically listening to RTE, to the BBC, reading uh, CFAX and some of the text services uh, and putting the news together primarily from those sources. Now, as it went on, uh, we did begin to gather some of our own news and do some of our own programmes and do some of our, of our own interviews. Uh, but the staple diet, the, the staple source of news was other news organisations to be frank. Politicians conscious of the substantial younger audience Nova now commanded were keen to take advantage of whatever airtime was on offer. I think the smarter political types were copping on to the fact that uh, Nova was delivering the 18 to 25 audience, the audience that they just could not uh, reach. Uh, and bit by bit they started to come on air, then they started coming on in their droves. Hello, this is Seamus Brennan, TD. It's funny, isn't it? But when we have jobs, we tend to forget those who haven't any jobs. Uh, hello, this is David Andrews. I'm a doll deputy for the constituency of Dunleary. Uh, I'm asking you to support Radio Nova's project to provide work experience. I remember one night being out with, with, uh, with Kerry and we were at a function and he went up and introduced himself to, to Charlie Hahi. Uh, and Hahi was only delighted to have his photograph taken with the guy who owned the biggest radio station in town. But then someone gave out, I think some lefty group gave out that the government ministers and senior politicians were on Nova. And then of course they ran like scalded cats. They were nowhere to be seen. And to be honest, I couldn't really blame them. But at senior government level, the political noises were less than reassuring. And over at RTE, there was anger bordering on fury, particularly at the fledgling Radio 2. We couldn't really crack the Dublin audience because it was seen perhaps as being slightly more sophisticated. Nova had that sophistication about it. It had that sound of an American radio station. It had that American jingles. We didn't have them, you know, or we didn't, Radio 2 hadn't come that journey. Imagine how frustrated these guys were. They were out there in their big offices out in Donnybrook and uh, they were being beaten by this kind of two, two roomed uh, setup all, almost. The whole business changed with Nova and the people who ran Radio 2 at the time, they weren't businessmen or women. They were career civil servants, they were career RT people and they really didn't know how to do it. And I think it, it's unfair to them and I'm not defending them, but it's unfair to them to say they didn't know how to handle it. They just didn't know how to handle it. As RTE saw it, why should an unlicensed operator be allowed to run riot across their airwaves, hoovering up their audience without paying tax or royalties? RTE, as in Radio 2 at the time, was paying money for every single song it played. Radio Nova was paying nothing. As Carey saw it, why should a state-controlled body receiving tens of millions in taxpayers' licence fee income be allowed to offer their customers a substandard product? The lines were drawn for battle. And I think when we started having this huge effect, economically making so much money, taking revenue from RTE basically, having the big advertisers on, the big names, um, having the governments, uh, the, the politicians on and everything, I think, yeah, pressure, that's when the collision course was inevitable. Despite claims of interference by Nova's signal with military communications and emergency services by RTE and the PNT department, a claim which was never proven, the real issue lay in the increasing threat to RTE's listenership and the increasing impatience at Montrose. Possibly true. I, I think, um, although there will never ever be any record of that, I don't think anyone will own up to it. But I think if you, you know, the, there was probably something of a siege mentality developing, particularly at 2FM uh, in, in RTE. And that would have been fed up the chain. Well, it wouldn't surprise me if RTE was putting, a, at the time, a lot of pressure on the department to deal with the pirates. Because it had gone from the chaotic situation where you had really little mom and pop type broadcasting operations that really probably weren't having a huge economic impact to the situation where you had a you know, number of super pirates as they became known. Nova was one of them, Sunshine was another, and there were a number of others, which were, I'm sure, really eating into RT's revenues. So there was a very uh, urgent commercial imperative, I would have thought from RT's point of view, to get the pirates off the air. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me the least if there had been that pressure, and I could, I could see why. Whatever was the real cause and whoever took the ultimate decision may never be known. But on the morning of May 18th, 1983, Department of Posts and Telegraphs officials moved to close Nova down. It was a day like any other day. It's 21 and a half minutes past eight. You were telling me you had a story there for us, Bob. Who can it be knocking at my door? And it was a guy in visiting the station, Ray Irwin, and he went upstairs. And I said, would you answer the door and just see who that is and let them in? And he comes down to me and he says, 
uh, it's the guards and it's the department. And I said, now stop winding me up. You know, Radio Nova is a law to itself. The guardy come in for cups of tea, they come in visit. There's, they're not here to raid it. Yeah, they want to talk to Chris Carey. And I had to go and talk to them, and uh, they were officials for, of, of, of the P&T, I think it was at the time. Uh, really, I just went down to the studio and said, just stay on the air, guys. I'll try and, try and see what's going on. Can it be knocking at my door? And there was a very sort of officious sort of guy from the department saying, uh, we want to speak to uh, Chris Carey, we want this radio station off the air. Well, the transmitters uh, are, in, are up in Red Farm. Yeah, we know the transmitters are there. We want the keys to uh, location. Declan uh, was putting out calls for Chris Carey to contact the radio station. Meantime, I was sitting in a car with one of the P&T officials uh, being driven to the transmitter site or the AM transmitter site. I heard Bob asking for Chris Carey to go to the radio station. And I said, ah, is this it? What was very funny about that day was I had grown a beard. I decided in my wisdom that I would remove the beard. And I proceeded down to work in Herbert Street, uh, came to the door, met, if I'm not mistaken, Tom Hardy at reception, and he didn't recognise me. And I said, Tom, it's Mick. And he says, oh, so it is. We've been raided. A guard came into the studio and he sort of uh, looks around and he says, uh, hi, uh, he says, um, I know that you've got a, a competition running for a holiday at the moment. And I know you will probably be back on later in the week, but I have here uh, three postcards to, to put into the post bag for the draw on Friday, okay? Thinking they'd come to pick up a small portable transmitter, the P&T men arrived in a small van. What they found was one of the most sophisticated transmission systems on the island. Mike Hogan and I arrived, and Tom Hardy was already there. He'd got a lift up with the, with the P&T guys. Um, and they were literally hauling stuff out the door. But I think they were astonished at what they found. And they had no concept of, of the, the huge amount of equipment that was on site. You know, they were used to dealing with the Radio Dublins of this world, uh, expecting to put it in the back of a, you know, a high ace or something. And I think they had to call out flatbed trucks to remove this huge monster of a transmitter that had been shipped in from the US. Raids on pirate stations had all but ceased in the 1980s, so the government move on Nova was a bolt from the blue, and in the pirate community at large, there was widespread panic. With the number one illegal station in the country effectively closed down, others began running for cover. But right now, we're being raided by the Guardi and officials from the PNC, and they've come to confiscate our equipment. So for me, Robbie Dale, and Robbie Robinson, the Managing Director of Sunshine Radio. Bye-bye. We hope to be back, but we'll just have to see how it goes. Thank you, one and all. But Kerry had other ideas. Chris and the news people, Sybil, and maybe Dobson and all the people who were in the office, and Dave Harvey, would have had a meeting in or around the lunchtime. We were off the air. We had run our business, and it was a business, a successful business, in a very, very professional way. And Chris says, you know something, we can't let it go. We'll go on and we'll say goodbye. This wasn't about government. This wasn't about um, influences from other quarters to close us down. This, was, this is radio. It's about broadcasters and the relationship they have with their audience. Using a low-level transmitter, Nova crept back on air early the next morning and announced its own plans to close itself down. Once again, the authorities were powerless. We borrowed uh, a really crappy little AM transmitter, a uh, few hundred watts, which was fed into the main AM mast. And I think there was a low-powered FM signal coming out of the, the Herbert Street building. Uh, it was a day of complete rabble-rousing. There was a great buzz and a great um, sense of anticipation as to what we were going to do. There was a great outpouring from the listeners that they had seen something taken away from them, that they didn't want taken away from them. 
um, and there was a lot of talk as to what way we will finish. Using a series of cleverly worded on-air promotions, Nova scheduled its own close down for 6 p.m. that evening. Tonight at six o'clock sees what could be the end of the most exciting period in the history of broadcasting in Ireland, when Radio Nova goes off the air. Despite the fact that the overwhelming majority of people in this country want the right to choose what station they listen to. I, I can't remember who got a call from, it could have been Declan, said, what time are you going to go on it? And I said, I don't know, probably second last. I don't want to be the last on it. I was the first on it, but I don't want to be the last on it. And tonight at six o'clock, come to the headquarters of Radio Nova at 19 Herbert Street and show your solidarity. If you can't get to Herbert Street, then at six o'clock, blow your car horn and blow it long and loud. The answer is in your hands. Don't let us down. All day, Nova staff came and went on air in a series of half-hour, double-handed shifts. I said it earlier on, sir, Mr. Meehan, it has been great working with you. Yes. And it's been great for you to work with me. It really has. It's <laughs> done you a world of good. I'm sort of lost for words about this. All I can really say is that it's really been exciting yeah. working for the best ever radio station in Ireland. And in fact, I can understand when the radio stations get organized around the country, you're going to have the program director saying, now look, I want this station to sound like Radio Nova. Right. Get me a Declan Meehan type. <laughs> <laughs> and my address her. is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll meet again, we'll meet again. We'll... The Nova News team broadcast a series of public appeals for support of the close down that evening, while simultaneously castigating the government and RTE for their actions and inviting listeners to call or write to their public representatives. The Leinster House and RTE switchboards received thousands of calls of complaint. The number of independent stations throughout the country diminishes hourly, so in a time of worsening unemployment, hundreds of young people are being forced unnecessarily to join the Dole queue. Oh. By five, hundreds of people had gathered outside the Nova building on Herbert Street. There was the fear and trepidation of what was going to happen and how the close down was going to ha be handled, what we were going to do afterwards and uh, where are people going to turn up. And slowly but surely Herbert Street filled up like Lansdowne Road on a Northern England game. The street outside was jammed with people who turned up for what had been announced would be the final close down of Radio Nova at six o'clock. That, that was a kind of bittersweet experience because on the one hand I suppose it was encouraging that so many people uh, we're sad to see the station go, and then you know we, we were facing a situation where, as far as we knew, that was it. It was going to shut down, and it was going to be gone. What makes me sad is that there are 43 people working in this building, most of whom, all of whom, are my friends, and we're all unemployed now. And we needn't have been unemployed because our jobs were quite viable. They paid for themselves, which is more than we can say for a lot of jobs in this country at the moment. Inside the offices, presenters from other stations had gathered to witness what in time would become regarded as an historic event in Irish radio. Even Robbie Robinson showed up, old rivalries put aside for the present. And on behalf of the Sunshine staff, thanks to Robert and, and thank you all for your support. And I say keep the support pouring, pouring in. Don't forget, tonight at six, and I'm sure all my staff will join in that, tonight at six, blow the horns outside here in Herbert Street, and next Thursday morning, outside the four courts at 11. As the time ticked towards six o'clock, the mood was approaching fever pitch, and the numbers of people and cars in the Baggett Street area was causing serious traffic congestion. It was left to Tony Allen to orchestrate the final moments. Tony was the first person I met when I went into to Nova. He was the respected um, professional image of pirate radio in Dublin. But the one thing about Tony as well, he's probably been associated with more closed downs than anybody. And people have always said, Tony Allen does great close downs. So he was the obvious person to do it. But no one quite knew what he was going to do. You're listening to Radio Nova, broadcasting on 819 kilohertz in the medium wave band and on 88 FM in stereo. The time is now six o'clock. And right now, we want you to blow your horns wherever you are and make noise.
had the radio on and I was recording it. And I, I must have I, I must have the tape somewhere at home, uh, which was ridiculous. And it was all that Nova, Nova stuff outside. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I actually genuinely was very emotional because to me, Nova represented everything that we all wanted independent radio to be. The fact that it was closing down um, made me feel, God, you know, we've lost the battle. The voice of Dublin telling the people who should be listening what they want to listen to. And then it was all over. Well, let's go down the pub. Or was it? Radio Nova. English DJ turned entrepreneur Chris Carey had founded Radio Nova and because of its extraordinary success, in May 1983, the authorities had closed it down. But within days of an emotional close down, the station was back on air. Carey's decision to keep going was driven, some say, by only one thing. Money. <laughs> it's always the same with Carey. I mean, he was a good programmer, but his interest was money. And, you know, there was no downside in switching on a one kilowatt FM transmitter, getting the station back up and running uh, and making more money. Having moved to close down a station as popular with young people as Nova without proposals for regulation ready to go, the government had been well and truly burnt. They did very little, but sure, I mean, what do you expect of governments? They, they tend to be so out of touch with what people think of, and they tend to do very little, and the little they do, they tend to get it wrong. They're politicians. They'd run Nova off the air. The people had said, we want it back on air. Kerry put it back on air, and really, the government had nowhere to go. They'd really blown it uh, in terms of illegal radio, and I think that's what gave Chris Kerry kind of a free run to do what he wanted. Radio Nova was back in business, and even the staff were astounded at Kerry's audacity. Absolutely shocked. Yeah, but got to remember, Radio Nova, my job, the 100 quid that I earned there every week was my only source of uh, income at the time. I had told my parents I had no job and I'd gone home fairly crestfallen, feeling a bit sorry for, for myself after the euphoria of the close down and was brushing myself off and dusting myself down as to where next I was going to get a job in that godforsaken country where there were no jobs. To be told, to receive a phone call from somebody to say, come on in, we're back on the air. <laughs> so I was really surprised, I was really shocked. But the day Nova returned was really the beginning of the end. Unsure how long the station would last and for how long the money would flow, Chris began to think of cutting costs. But he had more immediate problems on his hands. RTE had begun to interfere with Nova's transmissions. When the jamming started, that, that was the real problem. I would say that's actually the downhill mark. This is Radio Nova on 8.46 a.m. and FM 88. And a message for our engineers at our broadcast site for the please switch to the other link. We had a microwave link between Herbert Street, where our studios were, and uh, the Three Rock Mountain uh, transmission site. And RTE installed a similar frequency microwave link in a building, which was the RTE Museum uh, at Portobello Bridge in Rathmines. And the link was set up to fire straight at the Three Rock Mountain site. We all knew it was RTE who were jamming the signal. Not only were they upset out in Montrose, but they were doing something about it as well. But they were taking the law into their own hands. It seemed to be a, some sort of unilateral decision by people within RTE rather than RTE, and particularly people who were members of trade unions. And that's relevant because the only union members at the time in Radio Nova were members of the NUJ. So in Chris's thinking was that if I can damage members of the trade union in Nova, who in turn were damaging my station being part of this union in RTE, well maybe that will put pressure on the people in RTE to stop the jamming because their members are being hit in Radio Nova. By firing NUJ staff, Chris caused a protracted and bitter dispute with the unions, a split within the radio station and the virtual drying up of advertising revenue. Chris's behaviour throughout was, as usual, unpredictable. 
The NUJ used to pick it at the end of Nova Park, at the end of this long road. And before they came along, he used to go out and dump diesel on the wall so they couldn't sit on the wall and they'd smell a diesel. Chris's erratic behaviour certainly wouldn't have helped in situations where that NUJ strike was concerned. And he knew how to rub people up the, the, the wrong way. But as far as he was concerned, he was king of the castle. It was his toy, it was his machine, it was his baby. And he could do with it whatever, whatever he liked. In time, Carey's plans would be his undoing, with Radio Nova finally dying an ignominious death in 1986, starved of advertising revenue after a long and tortuous battle with the NUJ. People started to drift away, people began to be disillusioned by the management structure, by the uh, recruitment policies, by the programming policies, etc. Q102 had arrived on air, and it just all became unfocused. There was also an inevitability that those who had helped make Nova such a success would eventually want to do it for themselves. And stations like Q102, led by Mike Hogan amongst others, proved enormously successful in the late 1980s. I think Chris had fallen out with everyone. He'd fallen out with the unions, he'd fallen out with his partners, he'd fallen out with the staff by and large. And I think in his heart of hearts he knew that he was never really going to get any further and that certainly no government was going to give him the radio licence. And I think the real end came uh, when the money started to run out. Then it was time for Chris to go and uh, he took off back to England. Twenty-five years on from the extraordinary events of May 1983, Radio Nova is still revered as the greatest radio station Ireland has ever seen. Ever since she left me, I should feel all alone. Many have tried, but never quite emulated its special magic. It probably doesn't mean anything to a lot of people now, but its legacy is that it, it forced change in this country where broadcasting is concerned. And this is the really key thing. Very little has changed uh, since Chris Carey innovated uh, 25 years ago. We've been tinkering with it ever since. He knew what he was doing. A lot of it was copied, but it was copied with great style and great panache. Uh, he really had a handle on what people wanted to listen to. It's something that uh, you know shaped that part of uh, our, our growing up. Uh, and uh, you know, and uh, that's always as long as we're around. That's going to be that's going to be his part of his legacy. It became as good as the people that Chris Carey recruited, and I think the class of '82, '83, '81 were some of the top broadcasters of an era. Just switch on the radio any day of the week, and it's there to listen to both in terms of professionalism and the quality of the individuals themselves. I mean, I'll be bold enough to say it changed the face of radio in Europe. And anybody now who looks back knows that, well, if we're at this stage in radio, it came from Nova. That's where it started. I hope she gets the message. Gotta get it back, you know. Gonna track her down, I'll find that girl. Gonna tell her that I love her so. Got the word on the grapevine. Spread it all around the world.